Last time we came to the epilogue of John's Gospel. That is, he'd already reached the climax in chapter 20, verse 28, where Jesus is finally declared, my Lord and my God. And then John immediately says after that, now I've given you enough evidence so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And by believing in him, you can have life in his name. And then we ask, well, okay, John, you've given us all these miracles and all this evidence, and you've reached the climax, you've reached the crescendo, Jesus, my Lord, my God, what's with yet another fish miracle after that? And we answered that question by saying what John was doing was the teaching of Jesus, taking his disciples back to where they started at the beginning of their calling, the same shoreline, the same beach, the same boat, the same, again, another fish miracle where Jesus first called them three years earlier to be fishers of men. And so we, 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 we understood, okay, we've got the epilogue, John, but we left out uh, one significant issue that has made theologians grapple for the last 2,000 years. What is the significance of the number 153 fish? Because I can tell you, if you look up to what the scholars say, there have been not 153, but 153,000 different interpretations of this, the significance of this number. And you've got everything from way back, 4th century, Jerome was saying that it, it was actually, um, uh, how did he do it? He had, um, no, that's right, it was 153 um, different species of fish according to some naturalists at the time and it turns out Jerome didn't even count it up correctly but he said that shows that the the mission of God's people is to all kinds of people throughout the world. Uh, the one, the scholar I like is the one who says you've actually got to just add up using the ancient Greek. Now that's not the Koine Greek, the New Testament Greek but the ancient Greek, so 400 BC, if you use that Greek and you count up the numerical value of each of the letters of the alphabet, but you have to pretend it's Hebrew and reverse it and count it backwards, you come up with, you guessed it, 153. Why didn't I think of that? I can't have been looking closely enough at the text, obviously. Well, we already introduced... Uh, what I think the 153 really is all about, and we'll look at it more today. But one of the recurring themes of John's Gospel is that John had remembered and written down all this material in the Gospel, and he says, as we were going through this Gospel, there's a couple of occasions where he says, we didn't understand what was going on, what Jesus was talking about at the time, until after the resurrection. Let's look at a couple of examples. John, back in chapter 2, verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Or in John 12, verse 16, at first the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize uh, that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Or John 20, verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So there's this information that John had. He was there, he's an eyewitness. He saw um, and heard Jesus and he wrote in his gospel, but he's saying, we didn't really get it at the time. We didn't really understand what the significance was until after Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, as we come to the to the close of the end, near the end of, of John's gospel, we too can look back over this gospel and see certain things that Jesus said, including some of the promises he makes, including some of the 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 um, 
statements he made that make more sense in light of the resurrection. We're closing up here with Jesus on the same beach where they started out, where, where Jesus called them to be fishers of men. And he gives them this great sign, this miracle of the fish, that John can look back now, we can look back now at John's gospel, at some of those things and say, what's this, what's this whole thing of another, yet another fish miracle uh, in light of now Jesus is risen? And we go back to where he, he's, he's called them at first and see that there's more to those things. Uh, back in chapter 15, Jesus, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he calls on them to bear fruit. Now that can have a lot of different, um, you know, applications in our lives, bearing fruit. But one of them, and, and the important one that we, we want to take hold of in light of what's being taught here in our text is that God is commissioning his disciples after his resurrection. And now all that stuff makes sense. In that same uh, chapter 15, back in John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said in that context, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, they've just got that first hand, haven't they? They've been fishing all night and caught nothing. But when Jesus is at work, the catch is overflowing. And that's... 153, the catch is overflowing. And, you know, 2,000 years on from when these Jesus commissioned these few fishermen to go into all the world, the ends of the earth, and here we are. Jesus' words have come true. And it's the same message that we, we've got today, that, that the same commission, the same mission that he's given to us, and we're to go out and catch fish, but not fish, but people. The trouble is, I don't know if you noticed it when you share the gospel, but no one's listening. It doesn't seem to work. Have you caught any fish? Have you, have you been out with a long night, labouring away with nothing? Well, that's because apart from him, you can do nothing. But with him, an overflowing catch. And that's the, the, some of those parables where Jesus says there'd be, be a overflowing, you know, 30, 60, 100 times and all these sorts of things. Um, or right here, what's the real meaning of the 153 fish? It's got nothing to do with the exact number. Remember, we looked at that last week. It was uh, indicating an eyewitness account. Someone was there, John, because the fishermen would always count the catch to divide them up among them. But the real point of the 153 fish was from nothing, apart from me, you could nothing, to overflowing, to a net full. And what about all those promises we've looked at in, in this Gospel of John where Jesus said amazing things, you know, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Or again in chapter 15, ask and it will be given to you. Well, what is that? Is that, what, see, in, after the resurrection, after this commissioning of the disciples near the end, and we'll see how uh, the fullness of this commissioning next time, God willing, uh, with, um, with Peter himself being reinstated for, for commissioning for, for this very mission. But ask and it will be given to you? What does that mean? You can have anything you want? Is that the name it and claim it gospel here? But if we look at it in light of the mission, if we look back on John's gospel now and see that these things, that you bear much fruit, that you become fishers of men, that you see the net overflowing. So it's not a name it and claim it, I can have anything, I won't ask God for anything. It's about tapping in 
to his purpose, his plan, his cause, his mission that as Christians we're all called to be part of. How would you like to see your net overflowing? You can't. (laughs) Because apart from him, you can do nothing. So what does that tell us? What does that tell us? If apart from him, you can do nothing, what should be the centre of the ministry, of the mission? Surely it's got to be, you have not because you ask not. Surely it's got to be prayer. You know, I, um, I've been here at uh, Clifton Hill Church for over two and a half years now, and there are still um, the ten people who were here when I got here are still here, and we have many more people now, praise God. How did that happen? Well, before I got here, with those few people, there was a prayer meeting. They were praying for years. And since I've got here, we've continued to pray because apart from him, we can do nothing but with him. So if it's going to be with him, how's it going to be with him unless we seek him? You might have thought after last week when I said, yes, we can see that there's there's a commissioning here of these disciples. He's showing them and teaching them about the commission. But you might have thought that, okay, we're going to look at this text again, that maybe uh, I'll be giving you some evangelism tips today. The how-to Oh, you know, to hand out the tracts, the books, the Bibles, to tell the gospel. Well, we've got to do that because how are they going to believe if no one tells them? But today we're tapping in to the secret, and I'm really drawing on the different points of John's gospel overall rather than the text to, to say now that the resurrection has happened, now the commission is happening, let's look back through John and see <clears throat> the amount of times Jesus exhorted us to ask, to pray. That's, that's the secret. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So you've got to go to him, to him, to see the net overflowing. We've got to pray. Now that means you got to be you got friends or family in your life that don't know the Lord. You got to be seeking the Lord every day in your own personal prayers. But we also have to pray together. When my people who are called by name will gather and pray, I'll hear from heaven. We need to overflow our prayer meetings to see God bring an overflowing catch because apart from him, we can do nothing. I mean, it's like he's he's inviting us. Come on. You want an overflowing catch? No, no, I'm a bit busy for praying. Hmm. You know, it's, um, and I don't like to pray out loud in front of others, but that's okay, just join anyway. Who cares? As long as we're together praying, seek the Lord. Who will commit to changing our prayer life? That it's not just something that's tacked in at the end of the night where I'm falling asleep, but a conscious effort to seek the Lord daily in your own life and join a prayer meeting as you're able. We have our prayer meeting here at 10.15 a.m. in the morning, uh, Sunday morning before the service. We have our monthly Kingdom Focus prayer meeting last Wednesday night. We had it. It was fantastic. God heard every one of those prayers. Look out because he's hearing from heaven. Look out.
Are we going to take up what is Jesus is really teaching his first disciples here? You need him to catch the fish. You can go out and evangelise all you like and nothing will happen unless he's in it. And how are we going to get him in it? Well, he tells us, ask and you shall receive. So <clears throat> there we have um, ministries going on here. Um, we have individuals we're reaching out. We're trying to reach our uh, friends and people in our circle. We have uh, ministries. We have door knocking. We have street ministries and, and all kinds of ministries going on. But are we going to send those people out without supporting them in prayer? You say, I can't go out riding a push bike like the guys do and so on. Well, don't go out, but pray for them. Pray. Pray and and commit to praying to support the work in that way. And if you do... Just watch God. Watch God bring the increase. And when we see people being saved and when we see God doing that work, we'll have no choice but to say like 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 John did. When when John saw this massive catch, it is the Lord, it can't be anything else. That's the point of the story, isn't it? You know, nothing, fishing all night, not a single fish, and then, boom, in one moment, overflowing net, no other answer other than, it is the Lord, it has to be God. And we'll say the same thing. As we see God give the increase, we'll go, hey, it wasn't the guys going out, it wasn't Bill, it wasn't, it was the Lord. It was the Lord. As we seek him in prayer. <clears throat> because apart from him, we can do nothing. Yes, we've got to tell the gospel. Yeah, we chuck up a few prayers. Like that's part of it. That's not part of it. It's essential. You know, if there's one thing I could, could impart to you today, that you would transform your whole thinking about what is really critical in your life right now, is that apart from him you can do nothing, And he invites you to seek him in prayer and bring your request before him because everything comes from him. Everything, he is the, he holds the human heart in his hand. He has the power. Everything you have, even the Food on the table, that's why you give thanks to God, because you wouldn't have that. It is the Lord. He's the provider of all things. If you um, get home safely and your family get home safely, every single thing that happens every day, it is the Lord. In a fallen, ugly world where evil is constantly the, the devil in the world and the flesh and everything else, the only only reason you're going to take the next breath you take, it is the Lord. He's God over everything and he's God over every human heart and he hears prayers from heaven. Will you commit to praying? And keep on praying, even if you've got to go through the long night, through a whole night of nothing, and the next night, and the next night. But keep praying. Now the world says all you've got to do is think positively, Work hard and it'll happen. Have you noticed you can think positively all you like and 
work as hard as you like and doesn't guarantee anything. It is the Lord. And if you try to, you know, gain anything in this life apart from him, apart from his cause, it, it's just going to add up to nothing anyway. You've got to get, get into his cause to be able to tap into this. That's what the, he's trying to teach these disciples here is I'm starting you off on my cause. And if you try compromising with the Lord, try to get a little something outside of his commands, it might seem good for a while, but in the end it's going to add up to nothing. Apart from him, you can gain nothing. So where does this uh, text finally head? Let's read in verse 12. Jesus said to them, so they've come in, off the, the, the boats come in with the fish, the overflowing 153 fish. And verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So they're so amazed. They know it's him. And you can almost picture this scene. It's it's the risen Jesus, but it's not like when they were cowering in the in the upper room and mysteriously Jesus suddenly appears like through the wall. Um Wow, is it a ghost or what, what's going on here, right? This is not like in a, a or a dark area where you know they could you could say, oh, maybe they were hallucinating or having a vision or something. This is out on the beach. This is coming at breakfast. This is face to face, out in the open air, and it's. A come and have breakfast scene. John started out this gospel with Jesus' first miracle back in chapter 2, a long time ago, back in chapter 2. And then there was this, this miracle of um, the, the water being turned into wine and Jesus revealed his glory to the disciples. But what was the setting? It was... A wedding banquet. They were, they were all together at a wedding feast, right? That was the first miracle to start of John. Now we're coming to the close of John and we're eating again. Could it be where we're getting a little foretaste of where the Lord wants to ultimately take us? The wedding banquet. And here's John in this part of the gospel. He's He's reached the pinnacle. He's reached the the climax with Jesus declared, my Lord and my God. And now he finishes with this same sitting down and eating. But because it's after the resurrection, we can see the significance of it. And so can the disciples. They're sitting down and having breakfast with God. That's, that's what this scene is here. And it's like pointing forwards to a future hope that God actually became a man so that he could sit down and have breakfast with us. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff in between to fill that out. There's a great journey to come to that point. There's a great cost on the part of God to come to that point. It began way back in the beginning with a garden and a, a beautiful garden and two people in love with each other, loving God. And what's more though, they actually walked with God. They walked with God. But then they were cast out. And we know the story. The world was thrown into chaos. Why? Because human beings rebelled against God and said, no, I want to go my own way. Human sin 
plunged this world into destruction and human beings were separated from God. Remember, they were walking with God. Now they're cast out and there's a corruption. There's a corruption in us. There's a corruption in relationships. There's a corruption in the creation itself, even thorns and thistles growing where there was before only beauty. And the pain and the toil of this world has meant that today you can't even sit down and have breakfast with anyone safely because you never know when the home invaders or the terrorists are going to burst through the door. And if they don't, then that bacon and eggs breakfast you're having, the cholesterol will kill you. There's something... There's so much in this world that says death is just around the corner. There's something wrong in this world. Death was this intrusion. And, and it happens so much to us that we kind of take it for granted. As teenagers die on the road and we go, oh, what a tragedy. But, you know, life goes on. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You could be next and you will be next at some point. Death has come in to intrude, caused by our sin. What did Jesus come to do? He came to reverse death, to reverse death, to pay the bank account, the debt that we owed, to pay the debt of our sin against God, that separation, for what purpose? Well, among other things, so that we could sit down and have breakfast with God. That's the plan. The wedding banquet, the ultimate future. You look more closely at what's going on in this, this picture here of the disciples sitting down having breakfast with, with God. This is the future, if you're a believer, that, that you're headed for, where the Lord says, come and have breakfast. Come and sit down together. Can you see? One day you'll see the face of the Lord. Right there, having breakfast with the Lord. And, and the faces of those who have gone on in the Lord, uh, friends or loved ones that you, you know that have gone on in the Lord, to see them sitting down together. You know, to us right now, that seems also spiritualized, distant, you know, so ethereal kind of beyond reality. But this picture here is the picture of the future. You haven't seen all of what the Lord has planned. It's a complete reversal, not just of death, but to return to that fellowship with God and with one another without all the corruption. And you'll see it when you sit down to have breakfast with the Lord. But we're not there yet. Why are we not there yet? Because there's still fish to catch. The Lord will not close up this corruption and judge this sin until all of those who are his have come to faith. And he's called you to be part of that. How are you going to do it? You can't convince anybody. You've tried that. It doesn't work. Apart from him, you can do nothing. So you've got to get serious about changing this prayer life. 
And not just the time you put, but the heart, the belief that by truly coming to him, that he's hearing from heaven. He's a heavenly father who only gives good gifts to his children. Praying and believing. I love the way that, that God actually sends this message. He's God. Did he, did he need us to do this? Couldn't he have just written a sign in the sky or you know, sent everybody an email, repent and believe? What, what, what's this idea of using his people to tell instead of God just direct. Of course he directs by his Holy Spirit and it's all of him, but, but in terms of why does he use us? And the answer is because God is a God of relationships. God is relationship in himself, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and he calls and draws people into his family. And he does it through family members reaching out to the lost family members that they would come in. It's about relationship. And it also is about us being part of his cause. So that not only you, but also your friends will sit down and have breakfast with the Lord one day. But it's not for everyone. Who's it for? What kind of people? Well, one of the guys there having breakfast was a guy who denied Jesus three times, Peter. Another of the guys who were there was that hard-headed doubter, Thomas, he was there. He was there at breakfast. And Nathaniel, Nathaniel the Winger, remember? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was there. He was there. Huh? And another couple of guys who John <laughs> thinks their names aren't even worthy of mention, so we don't know who they are. In other words... The people who are there, (coughs) Micah's included, the people who were there were a bunch of misfits like you and me. People who may have sinned against God, even grievously. People who failed God, but will hear the call to repent. And believe in him and you will be saved. Come and eat. Take hold of Jesus as my Lord and my God. And one day when you're sitting down to breakfast, you'll go, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. 